good morning, everybody. Would you please stand with your feet to your feet? We're going to worship God this morning. We're going to enter into his presence with thanksgiving and praise. I'm so excited to do it this morning. So come on, would you lift your voice and sing with us? Created from death, you came and you lived among us. You took on our prey, you walked in our pain, and now you're taking us higher. You stepped into time. You stepped into time.
All right, why don't we uh, go around the auditorium now and why don't we start shaking hands with each other and just say, welcome to church. taking a minute and loving on each other. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, and worship and praise this morning. I'm so excited to be in the presence of God with my church family. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you so much that you meet us right where we're at today in worship. We thank you that we can come together as a body of believers and just sing about you and, and worship you in spirit and in truth. And we love that. Such an honor. We don't take it lightly. So today, God, help us to fix our eyes completely on you, that everything else would fade away, that we see you for who you are, and that our response would be praise, our response would be worship, because you're so good. We thank you for who you are and for what you've done in our lives, and we worship you in Jesus' name, amen.
mountain shake before you The demons run and flee It's at the mention of the name King of the majesty There is no power in hell Or any who will stand Before the power and the presence of the great I am The great I am The great God for that truth that you have no rival and there is none like you there's no one beside you thank you for the opportunity God to worship and praise with like-minded believers in your house it's such an honor to know that we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords we praise you we thank you for all that you've done and God, I pray that in this next portion of our worship service, as we hear the word of God, let our hearts be so soft. Let us be so ready to hear from you, specifically into our lives and into our situations. And not just be hearers of the word, God, but to be doers. 
that we would hear what your word says and we'd implement it into our lives so that every day we, we could become more like you in your presence and by the power of your word we transform I thank you for that God let us be a church that changes every week let us not stay still but let us move forward in you and what you have for us growing deeper as a body of believers learning to love better learning to care more learning to sacrifice ourselves to be your hands and to be your feet I thank you for that God I pray for blessing over the whole rest of this service we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for praising God with us. You can have a seat. Hey, my name's Tim. Welcome to Crosspoint, and thanks so much for being here. At this time, I want to invite the ushers to come forward as we give. If you're new to Crosspoint, don't feel any obligation to give whatsoever. We're just so glad that you're here. If you did come prepared to give, there's a number of different ways that you can do that. You can place your gift directly in the plate as it comes down your row, or you can give online through our website or mobile app. There's a lot happening at Crosspoint, and we wanted to take a few minutes and share some things coming up for you and your family. Check this out. Get ready, men, for a weekend of epic manhood building awesomeness. That's right. On November 8th through 10th, we will head down to New Hampshire for the third annual Man Camp. There will be amazing speakers, manly games and sports, and all the bacon in the world to make your heart cry uncle. Don't miss the chance to be a man. Go on our website for a link to register. Get ready, families. Fall is here, and that means we are one week closer to our annual trunk retreat. On Saturday, October 26th from 10 a.m. to noon, please help us reach our community by decorating your car trunk and providing a fun, safe way for families to enjoy the season. We hope to have more cars than ever this year, and we're also in need of individually wrapped candy to give to all the children coming through, which you can drop off here at the church. If you can help us, please sign up online or at the kiosks in the lobby. The Shepherd Godparent Home will be having their annual dinner and concert on Friday, October 18th at Cross Point Church in Bangor at 6 p.m. Dinner and awards will be followed by a wonderful contemporary Christian music concert featuring Chasing North. Tickets are available for purchase through Lighthouse Radio Network at 947-2751 for $30 per person. All proceeds go to support our homes for women and children. Please consider joining us for this special night. If you're new with us today, we want you to feel at home and know that this is a safe place for you and your family. For us, church is so much more than just a Sunday service, and we want you to know that there's a special place for you at Cross Point. One of the best ways to get connected with us is to fill out the card in the seat back in front of you. Take the card after the service to our Connection Center in the back of the auditorium where we have a gift for you, just a small token of our appreciation for you being here. We also have prayer cards that you can fill out and drop off in the back as well. Thanks again for joining us at Cross Point. Have a great week. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. I, before I begin, I just want to say that the uh, uh, tickets for the Godparent Home fundraiser are also in sale in the foyer. So if you uh, don't want to stop at the radio station this week, you can pick them up after the service. Uh, Pastor Jerry and Pastor Gary are both in Nepal this week. So uh, I heard earlier on that they were watching live, so if they're still watching, I'll say hello to them. And uh, if I could have you guys stand, we'll do our verse. This is number 40, if you can believe that. 40 weeks into 2019. Okay, so here we go. John 3.20. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. John 3.20. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. One more time. John 3.20. For everyone who does evil hates the light and who does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Very good. You may be seated. 
I'll ask uh, Carol Conley, who is actually our speaker this morning, to, uh, to come up. Uh, you're in for a treat for sure. He's a longtime uh, member of the church and uh, currently serving as the executive director of the Christian Civic League. Um, definitely pleased for the third time this morning Thanks. to say welcome, Carol. Morning. Well, good morning, everybody. For those of you that are visitors, um, just want you to know that uh, I hope you come back and see Dr. Mick preach when we're all done. I hope I don't scare you off. But uh, Terry and I have been part of the ministry here uh, since 1992, so 27 years. I was 33 years old when we put up our, our mobile home and came up here from Massachusetts and unpacked and just a 33-year-old kid, and we've had an incredible time here, been uh, invested and just so thankful. And I just want you to know that as, as we prepare for this more a conversation uh, with friends and with fellow believers, and, you know, as I look out uh, in the congregation, there's folks that, you know, have known me for a long time. We've been through some great times and through some difficult times. I really want this morning... Uh, to be really a conversation with friends. Uh, I'm sitting down because the first service I wandered too much, so the camera guys asked me to try to anchor a little bit, so. <laughs> I, I do tend to wander a little bit. But when Jerry asked if I would speak on October 6th, I said, sure. And I said, Jerry, you know, if you'd like, I can continue in Matthew if you like, I've really enjoyed, you know, going through Matthew and so on. And he said, well, yeah, we could do it. I said, it doesn't always have to be a commercial for the Crescent Civic League, you know, when I, when I speak. I'm just happy to be able to serve the church because this church is so incredibly supportive of, of our ministry. And he said, well, that, that's a possibility. He said, but what's on your heart? And I shared with him what was on my heart. And he said, that's what I want you to speak on. So I, I'm going to warn you ahead of time. It's a very, very challenging topic. And it's a topic that is a result of looking at ourselves, looking at myself. Any time that we do that type of examination, it's to see disobedience or to see uh, where we fall short in the area of discipleship and so on, it is very easy, for me anyway, to fall into talking about a remedy, trying to fix it, to make it better. And in the past, you know, and unfortunately churches still fall into a pattern of using guilt, you know, as a motivation to address this issue or manipulation. And I want you to know it's my heart not to do that. And because of that, because of concern, fear, whatever, of doing that, this has been probably the most difficult week of preparation before I've spoken at a church that I love, that I feel so comfortable in, as, as preparing for this. So I want you to know that's my, my heart. And also I want you to know that before I even mention the topic, I want you to make sure that you know that not only are we trying to avoid guilt and manipulation, but we don't want to give a confusing signal in regard to legalism. You know, this church believes that the only hope that we have to be with God in eternity is through Jesus Christ and His grace that He offers us. It's not the works of the flesh that takes us from death into life to be saved, redeemed, born again, all, all, all those terms, to, to be right with God. That's a false teaching. But there's another false teaching of legalism that I want to make sure that we cover that we're not part of that as well. So I'm going to ask if they'd throw up the verses from Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, when the Apostle Paul is speaking to the believers in Galatia, in Asia Minor, where he says, you foolish Galatians, that's pretty harsh, who has bewitched you? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law 
or by hearing with faith. In other words, did you become saved through the work of the Spirit or was it your own works? So clearly the answer was through the Spirit. Then are you foolish? Having been begun by the Spirit and now being perfected by the flesh? And what the Apostle Paul is saying to these believers, people that have already accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you believe that you couldn't get saved without the work of the Spirit and not by your works, but neither can you be perfected or kept by works. And so when we, we talk about this challenging topic this morning, and it can be a real shin kicker, really can be. We've got to make sure that I want you to know that my heart is, yes, to be provocative. I do want to provoke us, but not by guilt, not by some type of false manipulation, but letting God's word and his spirit work in our hearts to draw us close to him, to, that we might execute the mission of being disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what is this topic? It's the question, do we care, dot, 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 enough? Do we care enough? Now, it's not going to shock you that the first example that I'm going to talk about this morning is from the political world. Imagine that. And certainly a topic of conversation before the services and after the services this morning has been, you know, talking about the Christian Civic League being part of the coalition, uh, where we were trying to gather signatures to give the people of Maine a chance to reverse a couple of what we think are really bad bills that passed in the last legislative session regarding tax-funded abortion and physician-assisted suicide. And we didn't make it. And it was terribly disappointing. And I've been asked publicly and privately, Carol, how is it that when, you know, recent polling shows that 62% of all Mainers, for instance, do not support the concept of their tax money going towards abortion, fail to get the signatures, but yet an incredibly more controversial topic like mandated vaccines, we're able to get the signatures and give the people of Maine a chance to deal with it. Now, when I answer this question, I want you to know it's not necessarily an advocacy about the mandated vaccine bill. The Christian Civic League absolutely opposed uh, the bill that took away the philosophical and religious exemption. It was a horrible bill. We're not anti-vaccine, so I don't want that to be a distraction. But to simply look at my opinion of why that succeeded and why the other one failed. And here's my answer. The individuals that committed themselves to make that happen were mama bears and papa bears. They were being told that we don't care whether you're under the belief that you are harming your children, you will do it. And there will be no exceptions. There will be no delays. There will be no choice that you have whatsoever as a parent. And if this bill stays on the books, you will not access education. You may lose your job, and you'll have to leave the state. And so those moms and dads and those grandparents were protecting their children and their families from something that they felt very, very strongly about. While we, on the life side of things, if I were to ask the question, do you think Maine cares about this bill and about the life issue? My answer would be a very sincere yes, I do. I believe we care. But I also think it's fair. Did we care about the concept of children yet conceived or vulnerable citizens, grandparents or uh, elderly or the disabled that would be vulnerable if physician assisted suicide, did we care as much about that concept as they cared about their children? And I think it's fair to say, no, we didn't. And we even understand that, those, that the, the differential may be in that motivation. So with that being said, we can understand kind of from a human level what compelled them to do that and why we may not have suspended our lives for three months and picked up a clipboard and gone to a Walmart or a festival someplace and actually faced ridicule and the inconvenience of collecting signatures and succeeding. But with that being said, I want to look at a biblical 
example about someone that was clearly compelled and someone that cared enough, and that's the Apostle Paul. So in Acts chapter 16, we're going to revisit a really familiar story. So if you grew up in Sunday school and you've been in a good Bible teaching church like this, you're really familiar with the story of the Apostle Paul, who one night while he was sleeping in the city, I think of Troas, somewhere over in Asia Minor, and a, he had a dream. And a man from Macedonia was beckoning him to come to Macedonia, come to Macedonia, northern Greece. So Paul and his crew headed to Macedonia in obedience to the Spirit of Jesus. And when they got there, they met Timothy, who became part of Paul's posse. And they met Lydia, remember the seller of purple? And she said she was a worshiper of God, and then she became a follower of Jesus Christ. And so they started going about the city of Philippi, which was a Roman colony under Roman law. And Paul started preaching the gospel. And in chapter 16, it says that a young slave girl that could tell the future was following them. And she would make the de declaration, listen to these men, for they're the men of the God Most High, and their words are the words of salvation. True statement, right? Yet the Apostle Paul, through the discernment of the Holy Spirit, recognized that she was demon-possessed. And Paul, it said, actually got irritated with the young slave girl and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command the Spirit to come out of you. And the Spirit left her, and she was delivered from that bondage. And everybody in Philippi said, yay, thank you, Paul. Right? No. No, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that her masters were very upset with Paul because this young slave girl had brought them much gain in her ability to tell the future. So they went to the magistrates and they complained about these Jews that are not following our custom and our laws. And I want us to look at a verse in Acts chapter 16, verse 22. And it said, the crowd rose up together against them, Paul and Silas, and the chief magistrates, the legal powers that be, tore off the robes of them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. And then, we know the stories that they get thrown in prison, and the jailer is told, make sure you keep them safe, you know. And so the jailer puts them in the innermost parts of the prison, puts them in stocks, and then Paul and Silas do the very natural response, right? No, a very supernatural response is they begin to have a prayer meeting and then they have a praise party. And the walls of the prison shook and they were delivered and the jailer came in and put a sword to his throat and said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And his whole family responded and were saved and baptized. And it's a glorious story and we love telling that story. But I want to pick it up in verse 35 where the apostle Paul, the next morning, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story, for you old enough to know who that is, where it says Paul is sitting outside of the prison. That's an interesting place for a prisoner to be sitting, isn't it? Outside the prison. He's not supposed to be outside the prison. He's supposed to be in it. And the verse says that the magistrates told the police to tell the warden that, Paul, thank you very much, but we've had enough of the exorcisms and the economic ruin and the earthquakes. Would you please just secretly shuffle off to Buffalo or some other city in Asia Minor? And thank you very much. And let's pick it up in verse 37. Paul said unto them, they have beaten us in public without a trial. Men who are Romans, we're citizens, and they've thrown us into prison, and now they want us just to leave secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. So Paul gets a little snarky, doesn't he? Paul reaches in the back pocket of his toga and whips out his citizen card and said, we have a problem. I'm a Roman citizen. I have due process. You might be able to throw me in prison for a couple of days, but when you beat me, you took away my right to trial and to due process. 
Go tell your leaders that I want to talk to them. And look what their response is in verse 38. It says, the policeman reported it back to the magistrates, and they were what? They were shaking in the boots. They knew they had re- really made a big legal mistake. Roman citizenship was golden. It really had great protections, and Paul knew that. They were afraid, and when they heard that, that they were Romans. Now, the rest of the story, you can read it, is that they actually came and apologized to Paul, and then he did shuffle off to, I don't know, Thessalonica or someplace. I don't know where. I can't remember. Lystra, maybe. But this brings up a really important question that I never thought of until about four or five years ago. If the response of the magistrates to them learning that when Paul whipped out his citizen card, metaphorically, was fear and let's, you know, let's make this right, then why didn't Paul do that back in verse 22? Because it was not an unruly crowd that ripped off his clothes and beat him. Who was it? The magistrates, the leaders of the city. So I think it's an interesting question. And I want to offer an example an answer to that that I don't say with conviction, but I've talked to um, different people and uh, Chris Nanigan, for instance, uh, about what he thinks about this answer. I believe the Apostle Paul, as he usually did, whatever he had, he was leveraging to expand the kingdom of God. And in this example, if you look what he does later in Acts 20, he does the exact same thing. He could have avoided a beating. I don't know if he could have avoided the imprisonment, but he could have avoided a beating, but he didn't. Why would somebody take a beating? And I believe the answer is this. I think he was trying to trip the appeal process under Roman law because he does the same thing in Rome. And we know, what does Paul say again and again and again in his epistles? Oh, that I could go to Rome. Oh, that I could go to Rome. He wanted to go to Rome. Paul eventually went to Rome. Why? To make his appeal? That's why not Paul wanted to go to Rome. Paul wanted to go to nurture the church of Rome. So how did Paul get there? Through the appeal process. On Caesar's dime, as I said in the other services, not first class, but it was Caesar's dime that got him to Rome to accomplish his mission to expand the kingdom of God. Now, as a side note, the Christian Civic League advocates for the value of religious freedom. That's something that we consider very precious and that we cherish here as citizens of the United States of America. It's a historical, unique thing that we enjoy, and it's even a a geographical unique thing when you look around. There's greater persecution in the world right now against Christians, I believe, than historically can say than there ever has been. But with that being said, we make sure that when we are advocating for religious freedom, that we don't confuse the world to think that it's all about avoiding losing our jobs or a beating or getting thrown in prison or losing our lives. Those are all things that, by the way, I'd like to avoid, if at all possible, but is that the end game? Avoiding discomfort? Avoiding persecution? Was it last week Jerry put up the picture of the men in the orange jumpsuits? on the shores of the Mediterranean who lost their heads for Christ. There's no guarantees, but it is a blessing. Our religious freedom is a blessing. But what is it about? It's about the freedom that we presently enjoy, of which we should be stewards, to propagate the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. It's not about our jobs. It's not about our reputations. It's about the kingdom. So with that being said, what is... The kingdom. What's it about? If that's kind of part of this, what compels me, you know, how can I be a person that cares, dot, 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 enough? Then let's look at the kingdom, and I encourage you to go to Matthew chapter 13. One of the shortest parables of Jesus in the Bible, and it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Pretty smart guy. Now, why do you think the man sold everything he had and bought the field? Do you think he was a dirt lover? 
Do you think he just loved dirt so much or loved grass or rocks? Do you think he was like a speculator, you know, that he thought that something really valuable was going to occur, like a grocery store next door or something like that? No. He bought the field for the treasure. That's what it's about. Now, I want to ask a question. Knowing that the land is not the cherished thing, but the treasure is, is it possible that sometimes we give the impression, or maybe even in reality, cherish the land more than the treasure? That's a rhetorical question. You know the answer to that. We all struggle with that. You know, what is the land? It's not necessarily bad things. It could be the lives that the Lord gives us, our families, our jobs, our reputations, uh, material blessings, church activity. You know, that is the land. And it can be things that we consider bad as well. You know, it can be distractions like lust or greed, um, lack of forgiveness, drama, you know, those things that are a distraction from the treasure. So what is that treasure? What are we saying about it, right? That the worship team did such a good job. You are my treasure. Jesus, he's the treasure. Jesus is the treasure. So what is that kingdom of this Jesus then? Now, I've got a definition that I wrote last night, so I don't know how much authority this has, but really, when we think about kingdom, it's where God reigns, right? That's where a king reigns is his kingdom. And God reigns in the hearts of his children. So the kingdom of, is God reigning in the hearts of his children who subsequently live out their God-given purposes. Their God-ordained purpose. So what are those purposes? It's really simple. Not simple to execute, but it's simple to know. God's called us to be worshipers and witnesses. That's what he's called us to be. Worshipers and witnesses. In that order. When we're worshipers, we will be effective witnesses. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Now, sometimes we go to verses like this, and it is so easy just to pass over them because we're so familiar with them. You know, uh, by the way, Romans 12, incredible chapter, incredible chapter, and two verses were familiar. Matter of fact, when Terry and I were dating, I think the first date we ever had was at church down at Pensacola Christian College. Of course, that was about the only way you could date was going to church. But our second date, Terry said, we're not going to date unless we memorize chapters together. So this was the first chapter that we ever memorized together. It's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. But what's it say? Therefore, I urge you, brethren, believers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, or a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your, what? reasonable or your spiritual service of worship. Well, those of us in the KGV things, right? Yeah. What's that mean? God says, by his love and his mercy, that's what should be compelling you to put yourself on the altar. Worship is sacrifice. Worship is submission. That's what it is. And so therefore, as you've heard many times, the problem with the living sacrifice is it gets off the altar. It doesn't stay on there. But when we submit ourselves and when we are in tune with God and we're worshiping God and we're pursuing Him and we're knowing Him, that makes us that effective merge. But we know that witness. But sometimes we're going to get off that altar. We're going to be distracted. We're not going to care enough. What is it that compels me to get back on the altar and be a living sacrifice? Now, I want to give you an example this morning that's a historical example of someone that cared enough and that was compelled. And it's actually a very secular example. You know, human beings can do incredible things. We're still made in the image of God, whether we're saved or unsaved. How many of you ever heard of Oscar Schindler? Oscar Schindler. How many of you saw the movie Schindler's List? Okay. 
That's Oscar Schindler. Oscar Schindler was born in Moravia, which is like the Czech Republic today, a very wealthy, shallow, materialistic playboy back in the 1930s. And he got a factory in Austria and was part of the Nazi intelligence. And he helped talk about movements of different troops and things like that, helped the Germans out. And for that, he was given 1,000 or 1,200 Jews to work in his factory, basically as forced slave labor. But something happened to Oscar Schindler. He had a conflict in regard to what was going on in the concentration camps and the atrocities that were being committed by the Nazis against the Jews. And he grew to care for those Jewish people that were working for him. And eventually, Oscar Schindler started bribing the Nazis when they started moving all the Jews out at the end of the war to keep them in his factory so that they would not be sent to their deaths at the concentration camps. He eventually sold nearly everything he had and has been given credit for saving over 1,200 people's lives. Now, I want to show what I think is one of the most compelling scenes in a movie that I've ever seen. It's when Schindler, who is now on the run, heading off to Argentina because of not being loyal to the Nazis, where he meets with these Jewish people, where they have actually pulled their gold teeth and given him a ring with the inscription on it, he who saves one life saves the world. Go ahead and roll this clip, please. What happened to Oscar Schindler to go from hedon to hero? What compelled him? Well, first of all, he became convinced that there was a calamity. Being convinced is important, but it's not enough because there were people that lived next door to Auschwitz and other awful places that knew what was going on in those concentration camps and did nothing. But it is an important first step to be convinced. Secondly, he cared. He cared. But he went from being convinced to care to something much more 
important. He was compelled to put his own life and everything else he had for the sake of his neighbors to courageously act on their behalf. And that compulsion is evidence to answer the question, do you care enough? Now, what's the key then? What's the key? Because here is, with Oscar Schindler, a man that was not even religious, as far as we know, and yet saved 1,200 people's lives, and today is the only Nazi buried in a sacred cemetery in Jerusalem, and declared righteous by the ancestors of those 1,200 people that he saved. Think about it. So for us, I want to ask this question. Remember, no guilt, no comparing ourselves to the Apostle Paul, no manipulation. But what about us? Are we convinced? Do we care? Are we compelled? We're a Bible-believing church. Cover to cover. Do we believe, are we convinced that there's a calamity, the reality of the world around us that passes from this life into the next without Jesus Christ into eternal hell? I would bet, being from the Christian Civic League, I probably shouldn't be betting, but I would be quite confident in saying that the vast majority of you said, yeah, I'm convinced of that. I believe that's what the Bible says. Not very convenient truth for us, you know, in this day and age, but yes, I believe what the Bible says about that. Then I would ask us, do we care? Do I care? And again, I would assume, sincerely assume, that you care. So the next question we ask is, do we care enough. What is the answer to this? The answer is pretty simple. It's love. It's love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. The second is that we love our neighbors as ourselves, and there is no law against such. Love. To know God is to love God. The answer, the remedy, is knowing God. If we know God, we will believe God. If we believe God, we will trust God. If we trust God, then we will courageously and inconveniently love Him and our neighbors. Uh, there's no way around that. So, I think our pastor gave a pretty good suggestion last week when he said, do you find yourself struggling? You didn't say it in these words, but that falling off the altar and not getting back up again? Well, you know, how are you doing like being like Jesus so that we are that living sacrifice that reflects God's glory and gives the love of the Father to this race that is in absolute rebellion. How does that work? If you're failing, if you're not measuring up, if you're, if you're not executing the mission of being a worshiper, what is it that compels me to do that again? And Pastor Mick challenged us last week, why not reacquaint yourself with Jesus Christ? Not with Christianity. Not with the church. All good things, obviously. But with Jesus. With a simple step of spending time every day. Ten minutes, three chapters in the Gospels. And again, not legalistically, like if you miss a day, you know, you don't have to beat yourself and flagellate and, you know, things like that. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about Seeking God and knowing God. Because if we do that, we know 
that you will have the opportunity to know the power of his resurrection. And I'm absolutely convinced of this as we get ready for the invitation. You know, I told you, I love this church. I love being part of Cross Point Church. I'm so thankful for the outreach that this church has in the impact that it has on our city. But I don't think we've begun to see the impact that we can have. Just think. Imagine if we individually and then encourage each other collectively to commit to pursuing knowing God. I believe that Bangor and the surrounding communities would be turned upside down. I really believe that. So as we dim the lights this morning and we prepare for the invitation, at the beginning I said that there are you know, two groups of people, not only in this room, but in the world. People who by faith have accepted the grace of Jesus Christ and know that when they do pass from this life into the next, that it will be from glory to glory. That we will be with Jesus Christ because of his work on the cross and the power of resurrection to forgive our sins. Nothing we've done, that is the gift of eternal life. We use different terms, saved, redeemed. If you're sitting here this morning and God is drawing you to him, I would ask you not just to, like I said to our brothers and sisters, to reacquaint with Jesus. But I ask you to consider, is God drawing you to him? We have a prayer that we use every service every week. And I'm just going to ask if we all would close our eyes and bow our heads. And if you've never given your life to Christ, I encourage you to say this prayer with me. Jesus, I know you are the Savior of the world and you died on the cross. Right now, I ask you, Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. And Lord, I ask for your help to help me grow spiritually, to be your disciple. And Lord, that I could continue in the path of becoming more like you day by day. If you prayed that prayer this morning, pencil is up here and other folks, I would encourage you, please, to come forward after the service or even now. But to those of you that know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, my brothers and my sisters, our family of God, I hope you haven't felt condemned this morning. I hope you haven't felt that this was a a contest of who's more spiritual. But I'm asking you right now to do business with God, to say, Lord, I'm convinced and I care. But I also examine myself and I find myself choked by materialism. I find myself paralyzed by fear I find myself desensitized by apathy. Lord, I commit to pursuing you and knowing you this morning. And I make that commitment to go to your word and ask your Holy Spirit to prompt me to do that, that I might know you, believe you, and trust you and be the worshiper and the witness you've called me to be. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.